All right. So um, the plan for today is to um, put some flesh on uh, the qualitative uh, uh, arguments that we put forward yesterday. Um, not very much actually, but a little bit more in order to progress uh, uh, a little bit towards the, uh, the goal uh, for this week, which is to set up uh, the entire mathematical apparatus uh, uh, that is needed to uh, discuss decision-making processes. So for today, we will have a little bit of a, uh, a mix of qualitative and more uh, uh, mathematical uh, arguments. But again, we will start quite, quite gently. Uh, so in response to, to, to a question uh, that was raised yesterday, which I think it's worth uh, um, uh, discussing in greater detail, um, I would like to spend uh, uh, a few minutes uh, uh, by uh, uh, comparing different paradigms for machine learning to see uh, in what exactly reinforcement learning is different uh, always reminding you that uh, eventually when you have to face uh, a challenging problem uh, like uh, learning to play the game of Go or uh, learning uh, how to uh, control uh, agents in very complex environments, you actually will use often a mix of the different paradigms. Okay, You can leverage on uh, supervised learning and unsupervised learning in order to strengthen uh, your reinforcement learning approach. For some purposes, it's actually necessary to resort to ideas from uh, uh, other paradigms. Okay, so don't think of this as uh, uh, compartmentalized uh, objects, but I will now highlight the differences. Okay, so um, not, not, not exactly what I wanted. Okay, this is a, clearly a rebellion. Okay. Good. So uh, I killed part of the text here. So uh, as a foreword, uh, we'll discuss how to compare different uh, machine learning paradigms. So I will make, make a very, very superficial and short uh, recall of what the different uh, main paradigms are. Again, boundaries are blurred, okay? So uh, I'm, I'm uh, oversimplifying here. But in a nutshell, uh, when you want to face uh, uh, a so-called uh, unsupervised learning problem. Uh, the kind of questions that you're asking can, can actually be uh, uh, formalized in the following way. Uh, you have some data, okay? And each of these uh, item in this data list uh, is a vector which belongs to some uh, possibly high dimensional space, okay? Each of those. Uh, and uh, in, in very, very simple terms, the question that unsupervised learning asks is whether I can find some representation in terms of probability distribution for this data, uh, which can be conveniently parameterized by a parameter which uh, uh, belongs to some space uh, Rm. And ideally, I would like this to have a much smaller dimensionality than uh, uh, the initial dimensionality of the data set itself. Okay, so uh, said in uh, plain words, uh, we would like to unveil the structure of our, of our data. We would like to compress them. We would like to organize them. Okay, so the goal of finding an effective representation for this. Uh, uh, data is uh, uh, essentially uh, this task, okay? 
And then there might be different techniques, essentially clustering data, dimensionality reduction, but all obey to the same principle. Find some compact representation of your set of data. Uh, supervised learning. Actually, uh, it's not entirely disconnected from, uh, from the task of unsupervised learning. Uh, so the idea is now that your data come in couples. In pairs, which belong to some space uh, R D times D prime, <coughs> each of each of these pairs. Uh, and uh, at a very general level, this, the supervised learning, uh, of unsupervised learning objective for this data would be similar, right? So if you were unsupervised, you would search for some distribution for your joint data, okay? Which as of now don't have any particular interpretation as they come. Uh, in fact, if you start thinking of this data as uh, inputs and outputs, okay, inputs and outputs, then you can see that you can settle for a less ambitious goal, which is nonetheless very interesting, is that for instance, you can settle for finding out a description of how the y's are distributed given the x, okay. So here you're putting some structures in your pairs of data in the sense that you're interpreting them as uh, independent and dependent variables, if you wish. Okay. And, uh, and then if you actually uh, scale down your objective even more, and rather than asking for the full probability distribution of this, you ask, for instance, for the expectation given some set of, given according to some unknown distribution, which has some parameters of y over x. Well, this is essentially in practice what supervised learning wants to do. So this is a function of some set of parameters, which is able to predict to some extent what the value of y, the expected value of y would be given x. Of course, you can do that if, as always, there is sufficient structure in your data. So this is the typical task uh, uh, of supervised learning. Uh, so uh, graphically speaking, this, this amounts in general to say that you have some data Okay, so here I'm plotting as a line what is in fact a high dimensional, uh, possibly high dimensional space both in X and Y. Uh, and I have some uh, scattered data, okay, like this. But my goal here is not to uh, understand what this full distribution here, here is, but I'm, I'm uh, uh, more than happy to uh, find out what a possible function could uh, uh, identify effectively the average distribution of the y's uh, for a given x, okay? So this is what my, my function f of theta of x would look like. This is what is called the regression task. Uh, not very different is the classification task only that now you are sort of restricting your uh, function to take uh, a final set of discrete values, which are the labels of your classification problem. So basically now the situation is like you have your data uh, like this. Okay, so suppose that there are just two labels. So you have pairs of data X, in which in this case are real uh, variables uh, uh, and labels which could be zeros or ones and then again the task is to find out what is the best description in terms of probability of belonging to one, one label or to another and this is what you would call uh, 
your classification task. But essentially, they, they are the same. Uh, <clears throat> so this is a very, very superficial description of what uh, basic, at the very basic level, uh, uh, supervised and unsupervised uh, uh, learning do. Uh, so there are two things that are conspicuously uh, missing from, uh, uh, from this approach to data. Uh, one of these is that, as you can see, there is in all these things and in the way you use algorithm to deal with the data, there's very little interaction with the data itself, with the data producing mechanism. So you get your bunch of data, then maybe you may manipulate it a little bit, you can separate it to a training set and a test set, but there's no really a continuous interaction with the data, okay? This is not something that has by itself a notion of a closed loop of a continuous interaction of online. You can use online algorithms, but they are not sort of built in the problem itself. You don't need that to, to do that, but you can do that, okay? And there's no, clearly no notion of dynamics in the sense that uh, the way the data are labeled need not necessarily correspond to time as we understand it. There is no sort of causal structure in the data. What comes first determines what comes next. So this is not necessary in the game. Of course, you can use these techniques and tweak them in order to describe dynamical systems, which goes a little bit towards the direction of uh, 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 reinforcement learning uh, in the sense that you can use them. Uh, so unsupervised and supervised learning for dynamics. Okay. So then the basic idea is that you explicitly have something uh, which is time and now your data X, say X I is actually a sequence so it's x i at times one, x i at some time, capital T. Okay. And you have many of them. So if you have many dynamical systems, uh, many dynamical sequences, there is many trajectories in your high dimensional space, you can use uh, basically, so this one, one single data so would be like a trajectory. So this would be the x i and this would be times going from one to capital t and suppose you have many of these trajectories and then you want to understand whether you can describe this process in time so for instance one one thing that you could do is to look for some parameterization that gives you the probability that i am at time x i'm at position x t plus one given that i was at position x t in this case you are seeking for a markov model of what is happening okay you're trying to describe your process as taking in steps in which the next steps doesn't depend fully on entirely on the memory but just on the previous step and then again you can apply either unsupervised or supervised learning depending on which situation you uh, you are in to find out what the best description in terms of parameters is uh, which goes a little bit towards the uh, direction of reinforcement learning in the sense that we are adding this dynamical components, this prediction over time. Uh, but still there is very little uh, interaction with the data itself in the sense that I told you, you get a bunch of trajectories which were generated by an oracle or observed experimentally. And then you basically try by machine learning approaches to derive a model, to construct a model or to select among possible models. Uh, so one thing that goes a bit more towards the direction of reinforcement learning, but still isn't, is what is known as active learning. So what active learning does, for instance, uh, 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 as a good example, is, a, is an example of a classification task. Okay, so let's go back to the situation we're discussing here. But now let's, uh, uh, just for graphical purposes, let's discuss uh, a situation in which you have, uh, say, two-dimensional input data with two components. Okay, these one and two now are the components of the pairs. Okay, I should probably use another notation, but uh, you will allow me to do so. So I have many data here. 
uh, which are uh, the, the red data. And I have the blue data. And the goal of the classification task, of course, is to find out whether I can trace some boundary here, or I can use some smoother description in terms of probabilities of belonging to one group or the other, all right? So in, in classical supervised learning approach, you, uh, you have your cloud of data, and then you just work some uh, technique, uh, you, know, you want, may want to use depending on, uh, on the structure of the boundary, if it's linear, you can use uh, perceptions or uh, support vector machines. If it's non-linear, you maybe want to use some some uh, kernel trick uh, to 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 uh, attack this uh, this non-linearity in the boundaries. There's a lot of techniques, uh, but what what active learning does is that uh, has a, an advantage with respect to these other approaches in the sense that in active learning you can ask for data. So for instance, suppose that I am in the current situation and uh, uh, I want to improve on my definition of what the boundary is. So a smart thing to do would be to query my Oracle, that is my environment, my data produ producing mechanism to say, okay, I have some tentative description of the boundary, which is this green line, and I want to improve it. Then why don't you give me data here? I want more data here. So when I am more uncertain, I want data there because this data will allow me, if they are crucially positioned there, they will allow me to sharpen the distinction between red and blue. I don't need any more data here. Sorry, someone has left the mic on and there was an echo. Okay. Did you want to ask questions? It's room H. It's unmuted for some reason. Okay, please just check your, uh, if you're muted, uh, if there's a echo again, uh, please mute yourself and then uh, you can unmute if you want to ask questions. All right, so uh, there is this, uh, this different notion of uh, being able to uh, uh, interact with the data producing uh, mechanism uh, by this means. Uh, and which, of course, can speed up enormously the classification process, okay? So uh, actually, you can prove that uh, uh, in this kind of classification tasks, uh, active learning can, can increase exponentially the speed of classification because you're asking the right questions at the right point, okay? Uh, so this is certainly goes more into the direction of reinforcement learning in the sense that when you learn by interacting with environment, and we can get back to the examples uh, of the system we, we've been discussing before, uh, you can push your system to go into directions where there is relevant information, okay? Uh, so for instance, think about the Roomba robot, which has sensors in front of it. If the robot is just uh, uh, by chance uh, ending up in a corner of the room and doesn't see anything, then a relevant action is just to turn itself and to look around because this gives more information about the environment than just staring at the, at the, uh, at the corner, okay? So this kind of information seeking actions are very important in reinforcement learning. Uh, so uh, in a nutshell, when we uh, think about reinforcement learning, we are basically combining these two ideas. First of all, we want to uh, construct a description of what will happen in the future, because this will allow, allow us to predict what will happen in the future. And that's the first step. So this, the first step is to remember that uh, we need to predict. And this prediction can be done using a model, but also not using a model that is based yourself just on previous observations to infer what will happen in the future without using a generative model of what will happen in the future. Once you have 
are able to predict what will happen in the future, then you want to control. These are the two things that are not embedded in other uh, paradigms for, uh, for machine learning, okay? So, uh, like I said, nevertheless, uh, we will discuss situations in which uh, we can leverage on other ideas from machine learning and especially artificial neural networks, uh, but not for the purpose of learning in a supervised or an unsupervised way, but rather thinking of them as, as powerful function approximators. Okay, so this will be uh, clearer in the, in the following, but I hope this uh, short uh, discussion helped somehow to, uh, to clarify a little bit more what, what is similar and what is different uh, with other machine learning frameworks. Any question on this? Okay. Uh, so now, now we revert to our uh, initial uh, um, uh, agenda. And uh, uh, the first uh, key ingredient that we introduced today, uh, which is uh, still not a very quantitative description of the process of decision-making, but nevertheless is very important in, uh, uh, in the following, is uh, uh, what is called uh, the agent environment interface. Uh, so we, we start introducing a little bit the lexicon uh, for uh, uh, to set up the, the, the decision making problem. So this agent environment interface is an abstract description of a, an adaptive autonomous system, which aims at encompassing basically everything. Everything means every problem that we discussed yesterday, bandits, robots, engineering control, you name it. Any decision-making process should fall into this description. Of course, if you aim for such a large description, this description will necessarily be very generic, but also very flexible. So what is the idea? Is that we want to identify some uh, uh, some basic ingredients in this uh, decision-making uh, process. And uh, in general, so this is also, if you open up a book on artificial intelligence, this is basically on page one or two. It's uh, uh, an abstraction by which we uh, identify one entity, which is the agent. And the agent, as, it, as you could probably know from the Latin means the one who does, okay? So the one who does things. Uh, and this agent interacts with the environment, okay? So the environment is something that surrounds the agent, but uh, formally, typically uh, we depict it uh, by using another box, which is probably not the best graphical solution, but uh, that's uh, how it is. So I don't wanna confuse you with other uh, graphical choices, but Outside of the agent, there is the environment. Now, where the boundary between agent and environment lies, it's a, a delicate issue, okay? It's something that case by case, as you will see that it's uh, sometimes hard to define when you think about, uh, uh, for instance, human behavior, okay? So what is exactly what is external to us and what is internal to us when the two things part is an issue in itself, okay? But for us, it's a very simple, very useful uh, assumption that simplifies a lot the mathematical description. But whenever you meet a new system, you should always ask yourself, what is the part which makes decisions and where it's the boundary between what is not uh, under the control of the agent? So agent environment, how do they talk to each other? Okay, there are two interfaces between the agent of the, and the environment. So the first interface, uh, which I will like depict here in, say in blue, uh, uh, 
is the sensor interface. Okay, so here we're using a terminology from uh, from engineering, uh, but uh, for uh, living beings, the sensors could be uh, receptors uh, uh, on the skin or on uh, the organs uh, of any living being. Could be any signal that comes through the senses. Okay, so this sensor is an abstract interface which mediates uh, signals that come from the environment, and they are transformed into something uh, that happens inside the agent. So these uh, uh, signals that go from the environment to the uh, agent are called in general percepts. These percepts will eventually become some high dimensional vector, okay? Which contains a lot of information. And uh, in reinforcement learning, it has a very specific structure, okay, which we will discuss in due time, that is shortly, I hope. Uh, but for the moment, you can think that there, there is all the information that is collected uh, about the environment. So for instance, for a human, it's uh, uh, visual information, uh, olfactor information, uh, tactile information, uh, you name it, okay? Anything that comes in the form of uh, stimulus, uh, is encoded in this very high dimensional percept. Uh, it can be a faithful representation of the environment or it can be just a very partial description of the environment, okay? Uh, so for instance, uh, in, in the previous case, if you combine all your visual, hearing, uh, tactile inputs, uh, nevertheless, this is not a very accurate description of the full environment around you, okay? Things may, there's noise, there's a, uh, the vision is always uh, limited in extent uh, and uh, in angle of view. Uh, so this is often a very partial uh, view of the environment. Nevertheless, it's useful sometimes to uh, abstract away and say that our percepts are a very clear snapshot of what the environment really is. Here we, of course, are sort of assuming that there are a few relevant degrees of freedom that are important and all the others, we can discard them. Sometimes this assumption is correct, sometimes it isn't. Often it isn't in, in sufficiently complex systems. But for now, the percepts are whatever comes to the agent. And then the second side of uh, uh, the interface is uh, uh, goes from the agent to the environment, if you wish, in the other direction. Uh, so this other interface is uh, uh, what goes through the actuators. The actuators are, for instance, in a robot, all the parts of engines uh, uh, and uh, 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 bolts uh, that uh, make the wheels turn, uh, that make the sensor, uh, 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 sorry, that, that make the, the robot move in one direction or, or another, Okay, anything that produces some uh, displacement of the state of the agent with respect to the environment. Okay, so the actuators modify the relative position of agents and environments. Uh, and what the agent does? Well, uh, this is an action. Okay. These are, this is the basic lexicon uh, that we will use <coughs> repeatedly in the following. So uh, at this stage, it's useful to go quickly back uh, to our uh, three examples uh, that we discussed yesterday and to review very briefly uh, what are the notions of uh, uh, agent environment uh, percepts uh, in the three different cases. So for instance, uh, uh, let's start with the, uh, uh, with the examples of uh, multi-armed bandits. And uh, let's let's think about a, about a, a a real situation. So you really are into a casino inside a casino, uh, and inside that casino uh, there are many slot machines stacked around. And uh, for instance, let's say that uh, just for simplicity, uh, they come in. Uh, so this is. Right. 
Okay. Uh, for synthesis, let's consider that you have uh, uh, two different kinds of slot machines. Okay, so this is my depiction of a slot machine. This is the arm. Okay, and you have uh, big ones and small ones. By this, I mean that just that they come into two different brands. Okay, so you have many of them, the big ones and the small ones. Okay, you may have several of them. And uh, uh, let's say that it, it's fair to assume, or you know, because you've been informed uh, uh, separately, that uh, the behavior of the small ones is different from the behavior from, of the large ones, okay? You, don't, you still don't know what are their probabilities of winning, uh, which is what you want to discover, but uh, you know that these things are, are different. For instance, uh, Let's suppose that for each of those, we uh, there is some probability of winning, okay? So which stays from zero to one, okay? This is, uh, this is the probability of getting uh, an amount of money which goes from zero to one every time you pull the lever. And uh, for instance, uh, you don't know what these distributions are, but uh, uh, I, I'm telling you that uh, typically, Large machines have two bumps in the distribution and small machines have just one bump. This is just to tell you that there are two, really two different uh, classes of distributions underlying by which you can distinguish them. And, but you don't know anything about those, okay? All these are unknown, none of this. You have to discover uh, what, which one is best in the terms of average uh, amount of money that you get out of these machines while playing. The problem is always the same. Uh, the reason I'm introducing this difference between small and large is, is because uh, uh, these are, this is some sort of side information in the sense that when you develop a strategy for these machines, okay, uh, suppose that uh, uh, you say, I want to play and uh, uh, I'm deciding, okay, this turn you play on large machines. And then you can choose which large machine you want to play. Uh, and then next turn, I decide again, now you're gonna play again on the large machine or no, now you're gonna play on the small machine. Then clearly in such a situation, you may want to have two different strategies, one for the large machines and one for the small machines. So this is what is called uh, contextual information. So there is something in the percepts. Okay. So in this case, let's go. Let's go through the through the steps. Uh, the agent, okay, is uh, the person who pulls the lever, right? Who pulls the lever? Uh, the environment is the slot machines. So the actions are pulling the lever of one machine, one and only one at a time, okay? Uh, and uh, what are the percepts? Well, here in this case, there are two percepts. One is uh, the money that I get, see what I win at each turn. And the second one is uh, what class of machines I can use. So this example is useful because uh, it already shows you that there is, and there will always be in our problems, uh, this structure in the percepts. This object, here, what I win is connected to the goal, okay? This is something which tells me what I'm gaining here, the gain. This part here is not directly connected to the gain, but it's giving me information about the context. And I want to combine these two, okay? 
So this is a general thing in reinforcement learning, and we will see uh, uh, more of this in uh, in the following. Uh, as a second example, let's consider the navigation problem, right? So uh, uh, navigation, which means the uh, cleaning robot. And uh, uh, it's useful at this stage to introduce uh, uh, a slightly more formalized uh, version of this navigation problem, uh, which is called the uh, grid world. It's just a simplified version of the problem of moving a robot around in the sense that it's always the same, but now it takes place on a, on a domain, which is tiled. So rather than having a continuum a set of positions uh, and velocities, etc. We just have discrete uh, arrangements. And then basically at each time step, our robot uh, is sitting somewhere in this. Uh, okay, so this is the position of the robot. And then what the robot can do is to uh, uh, hop onto a neighbor tile. Okay. Uh, and then around in this, uh, uh, in this domain, there are some places where, uh, uh, so this. there are some tiles which uh, All of this. There are some tiles uh, uh, in which you get uh, some prize, for instance, right? So this would be the dust uh, to collect by the robot. And then there is uh, somewhere around, there is also your, uh, uh, your charging station here. Okay. And maybe there's another charging station here. Okay, so you can you can put all the details you want. It's okay, uh, and the idea is that it can it has to move around, it has to clean uh, the dust in uh, the corners uh, and around, and then it has to go to the charging station. Okay, and you can define your goal in whatever way. So uh, clearly, uh, in this situation, it's not difficult to uh, uh, see that the robot is the agent. Uh, this grid. Uh, is the environment. Okay. Uh, together with the, uh, the prizes and the charging stations. Okay. All this is part of the environment where I can move around and where are located the the relevant uh, features of the environment. All this makes the environment. The actions are uh, the ability to move in one direction or the others. And the percepts, well, it depends on what the, uh, uh, the, the agent can see. For instance, we might say that uh, the agent has some uh, uh, localization device, uh, that tells it uh, that it's uh, somewhere around with a certain precision uh, like this, okay? So there's a sort of uh, range of localization, which, so suppose that it has a GPS, the GPS goes uh, out and then uh, gets back and he gets a signal that says, uh, you are in that location with the precision of a meter, half a meter, whatever. This is one possible way to locate it. Uh, so this is one, possible percept and then there may be others like the presence of the obstacles uh, by infrared sensors, you name it, okay? So I'm not just gonna be too, uh, too detailed on this because that's not uh, important, but there might be also uh, some uh, uh, like this. Okay, we have some angle of view here by which you can see things around. 
Okay, so this, these are all the, the percents. So here we we've been we have been positioning all these uh, uh, all these terms inside the things. Is that is that is everything clear up to now? Okay, good. Uh, so uh, now the next step will be uh, to formalize all these notions, these names and concepts. Uh, into a mathematical framework. And this mathematical framework will be uh, basically uh, at the base of everything we will discuss afterwards. So every time we think about a task in reinforcement learning, uh, we will have to have in our minds in the background, the idea that there is some decision process in the form of a mark of decision process, which will be a thing that we will be uh, discussing shortly. Uh, and how to sort of identify the various actors in this uh, uh, in this process. But before doing that, I, I'm taking five minutes more of your time uh, just to recapitulate once more uh, the the uh, discussion we had last time about. Uh, uh, the amount of knowledge that we have about the system. Uh, so if you remember yesterday, we have been discussing a possible way of arranging uh, our problems in uh, decision-making and reinforcement learning, depending on uh, uh, the knowledge of the model and the uh, observability. Okay, so it's useful to uh, to look once more at these two problems, the multi bandit problem and uh, the navigation problem, to see what it means to be in different positions of this diagram. So uh, just to focus on one case for uh, for simplicity, let's consider this navigation problem. Okay, so what does it mean to be here? Remember that we will start from here. In this corner up here, up here, you know perfectly know the model and you have perfect observability. So what does it mean to be there in for this problem? Well, first, because you're here, because you're you have a perfect knowledge of the model, means that you have an accurate map means that the agent has in its memory exactly the map that you're seeing now. It knows exactly where all the points are, where all the environment uh, has its features located. So where is the dust? Where is the uh, charging station? Okay, how the room has, is shaped? Where are the corners? Where are the obstacles in the room? Everything is already known from the beginning. You can also already see some sort of problematic aspects in uh, what I'm saying, but that's the setting. If you accept that you are here on the rightmost part of this graph, it means that you have an accurate map of what is around if you have a navigation problem. And first and second, if you are up here, this means basically that your GPS, this uh, uh, turquoise uh, circle that I draw, which uh, recalls the infamous uh, blue dot uh, of Google Maps, is very, very well localized. Okay, so you know exactly on which tile you are. This is what it means to be here. Accurate map and accurate location. Is there any question? Okay, I heard some noise in the background. Uh, what happens if you move down here? Well, again, you still have an accurate map. But you can't locate yourself clearly. Okay, 
So this is poor GPS location. So I don't want to write the GPS here because it's a bit too specific. Poor location. It's just like when you open your Google Maps and you uh, have a very accurate map of what is around you with everything uh, and kind you can look for for, for whatever detail uh, etc but uh, you have a very very large blue circle that tells you that you can be somewhere around in with an approximation of 100 meters which might not be good enough for you if you have for instance to reach one specific uh, uh, location and what it means to be here in this location uh, well if you are up here again this means that your location is good, accurate location. But you have a very poor map, okay? Poor or no map. Which is more of a situation that starts making sense in the sense that suppose that you are in the woods, okay? Uh, so you have a very perfect location somehow, I mean, your GPS is locating you within five meters, but the map has no features there. So there's no way of finding out uh, in which direction you should move uh, because you don't have any, any local feature. So you will need something else in order to orient yourself. But this is also a situation that is, always, is very often present in practice. And then when you go here, which is the place where the full reinforcement learning problem is, is this is the uh, usual situation, if you wish, in which you uh, have uh, poor or no map and location capabilities. The idea is that in the following for generic problems, uh, but you can always go back to this problem of navigation to fix the ideas if you want. We will start describing what you can do if you have an accurate map and an accurate location. And what you do basically is you ask your algorithm to compute the best route to the target, for instance. So this is the kind of things that happens in practice when you say, okay, I am uh, in a certain location in Miramar, Trieste. I want to go to uh, Monte Zoncolan. What route should I take? I have locations, I have maps, I have all sorts of information. It's a computation, it's a planning problem. And so we start from these problems first. And then we move to problems in which, okay, we have planning, we can do planning, but my location is somewhere comprised between Monfalcone and Muja. Can I still plan? Okay, maybe I have to sort of consider a distribution of possible routes depending on where I start. So I can still be able to do planning by sort of upgrading my problem from uh, the level of deterministic paths, if you wish, to more general probabilistic uh, inference. And then if you go into the upper left corner where you know where you are, but you don't have much information, then you will have to resort to different techniques, including uh, uh, empirical knowledge in the process. Okay, so we will discuss all the steps, trying to put all the pieces together and uh, eventually trying to approach the, uh, the, the most interesting part here by taking uh, the various lessons that we've learned along the way. Okay, good. So good time to take a break. Uh, so can I... Sure. Make a small question uh, about uh, there. There is one thing that I haven't understood very clearly: the knowledge of the model. So in this case, maps to an intrinsic quality of uh, the environment, or is a quality of the perception uh, apparatus of our uh, room or boat? Okay. Yeah. Uh, so uh, in in this case. Uh, um, because, because you say that when, when you were talking about uh, uh, the low left part of the model, you say that maybe this part of the map has uh, little features and cannot be recognized. 
So is it about the environment or about, uh, yeah, I mean. It's about, yeah, yeah, no, that, that's a very good question. It's about both, okay? So if you are here, it means that you are in uh, control. If you are on the right-hand side, it means that you have a good model of uh, uh, where you are, of what you do. That is, if I take an action, what will be the consequences of my action? You know that as well. So for instance, if you're a robot and say, I want to go east, but the robot skids and goes a little bit to the side, you know that, that this happens with a certain probability as well. You know that already. So you know the consequences of your action and you know also the properties of your observation system. So you know that if you are in a certain state and you, make a, you can make a certain observation with a certain probability. So this is part of your model. You have a model to describe all, all your, your interactions with the environment. So it's a property which combines the environment and the way you interact with it. Having so a model is a very powerful assumption. It's right on the fuzzy line that distinguishes the two entities, basically. Exactly. Another that, thing outside, yeah. The the um, so while we are talking about this particular problem, for example, we saw that we can be at any point inside the, the this graph. Basically, mm -hmm. we can think of different. So while we think of this as moving through solving this problem is a. Uh, uh, path through this graph, or we can think of uh, the single problem instance as being located somewhere in the graph uh, and staying there put. Uh, OK, so or, the, the formalism that we will describe includes all sorts of situations. So we can, as you will see uh, in a formal description, uh, it's uh, in general something which happens on a graph of abstract states. And you move around in this graph of abstract states by taking actions that can lead you close or far. So it's, uh, uh, in, in a sense, it's the framework was going to be extremely flexible with respect to this. I chose this particular example because uh, uh, it gives some sort of intuition about what kind of objects are thinking we're thinking there. But the, the, the framework is general. Is, did, did that answer the question? No. Yeah. yeah um, uh, no. Yeah. I think. Uh, I think. Uh, yes. This. Um, I maybe I was distracted by the answer. In any case. So the the point about this abstract space is what takes uh, 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 in consideration the state of both the agent and the the environment. Uh, this abstract. Yeah. yeah. When when we talk about the state, uh, and we will do that uh, shortly, uh, mm -hmm. you always have, have to think that it's uh, uh, a property of jointly the agent and the environment. So it's a, yeah. if you want, it's a relative state of the agent with respect to the environment. Just to give you an idea, a very, very simple example. Uh, so I, I'm sitting, I'm the agent in my room, okay? Uh, so I can do this action, which is uh, push my seat back, okay? So you can legitimately say that uh, uh, all the rest of the environment hasn't changed, okay? But my state with respect to the environment has changed. So in this sense, we will say that there has been a change in the state. Then there are other ways of operating changes in which, for instance, I take this pen and I displace it one meter to the side. And then in this case, you will say, okay, but this, you have changed the environment. And I'm arguing that, and actually that's the common understanding of this thing is that both things are changes of state in the sense that what matters is uh, the relative uh, position of agent and environment. So we do talk about a state in general, maybe more than uh, about uh, the single entities. Uh, yeah, exactly. We, we talk okay. about a state as a, as a general object. Okay, yeah, that makes perfect sense. I mean, it solves the, the fuzzy distinction of problem because yes, so we say, yeah, it's, it's a state. One has to, need to be careful, yes, I agree. Thanks. Sure. Any other question? Okay. If not, we take our usual break and uh, we reconvene at uh, 10 past 10. Okay, thank you. Later. Uh, professor? Just a second. <laughs> 